All right, tonight we're focusing on customary law. A social justice and customary law conference has been asking whether South Africa has achieved equality and other human rights in terms of customary law. It was hosted by Tuli Madonsela, who's the Law Faculty Trust Chair in Social Justice at the University of Stellenbosch. She is, of course, also well known as South Africa's former public protector and the founder of the Tuma Foundation. Ms. Madonsela, thank you for, for being with us. Can, can we just start uh, with a, a brief history lesson? I think people who don't know much about customary marriages, for example, maybe don't know what, what rights uh, the, the women have in those marriages. Can, can you run us through some of the main provisions of customary law in South Africa? Well, firstly, thank you, dear colleague, for the privilege and, and greetings to you and everyone who is watching. The conference was looking at customary law in its entirety, and obviously marriage is central to customary law. When it comes to customary law, currently in South Africa we have a dual legal system, which means you can get married in terms of civil law, that means you sign and you go to court or you, you have somebody who is authorized to sign, it's called the white wedding, or you could get married under tradition. The, differences are twofold or key differences are twofold one is currently it's not really clear absolutely when are you married under customary law because when we're drafting the recognition of customary marriages act they were old marriages they were diverse practices in different cultures and we didn't want to do what was done during colonialism where zulu customary law was superimposed on all customary laws but in so trying to accommodate diversity we have ended up with uncertainty and a whole lot of people are suffering so that's one part of customary law that is different to civil law the second difficulty under civil under customary law is that a husband under customary law in south africa can marry more than one wife and a woman cannot marry more than one wife and there's two problems with this just firstly there's an obvious inequality in that only the men can marry more than one wife and it can't be argued that this is 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 how it was done in the past. We have said that customary law is dynamic and fluid, and of course the Balobedu, where there's the reign queen, uh, the the queen has always married more than one wife. Um, so that's the thing. In Kenya, where the constitution is similar to ours, polyandry, where a woman can marry more than one wife, is allowed. Another difficulty that is related to that is is the fact that. We provided in the Recognition of Customary Marriages Act that the husband should consult the wife before taking uh, another wife. Well, some consult, some don't. But if you're consulted from a position of inequality, you're going to say yes, because yeah. you have limited options in unequal power and unequal property. Just lastly to say, though, the key problem was not just the issue of marriage. There was also the problem of Ugutwala and other forms of gender-based violence, and also the issue of land. And ultimately we concluded that today is better than yesterday, particularly because the courts, even by the admission of the Minister of Justice, have been in the forefront of transformative constitutionalism. But everything has been hampered by a colonial lens that has been used to view customary law. Firstly, it tends to be seen as a repugnant legal system because of the colonial lens that you looked at it as inferior and uh, as an inferior form of regulation. Secondly, there's a tendency to fossilize customary law. In other words, to take what was and, and say it is right now when leaving customary law would have changed on the ground. Thirdly, there's a tendency to use one customary law as the prism through which all customary laws should be judged. And yet different tribes in South Africa might have, in, might have different nuances. Again, yeah. that was a colonial practice which was um, appointed out by both the Minister of Justice and Ad Advocate Ndugai Dobi and the Deputy Minister of Justice, Patekile uh, Holomisa. The, the fourth dimension is the fact that just generally customary law tends to be distorted. In other words, the provisions of common law are superimposed into understanding what customary law is. An example of that is that in the past, 
women married under customary law were viewed as minors, and there's no such practice under any of the customary law practices in Southern Africa. Yeah. And another distortion was the assumption that because there was no conveyancing under customary law, there was no ownership. And Advocate Ndugai Tobi pointed out, using the case that has just been decided now uh, in, the, in the High Court on the Ingwenyama Trust, to indicate that people can own property under customary law and they do own land, perhaps as a group, but they do own land and the land does not belong to a traditional leader. Professor, th this has raised so many issues and I think you've said customary law should, should just be looked at like any other laws, what, what's working and what's not. Um, I hope we can chat again in future about uh, these uh, issues. You know, a lot of people, if they can't prove that they're in a customary marriage, you can't assert your, your rights. But I'm really interested in the, in the one issue that you were talking about, which is uh, gender justice. You, you've touched on that. But also, we, when we talk about culture and traditional communities in South Africa at the moment, um, there's a lot of decrying what, what's going on because, you know, a, a GBV, gender-based violence, is blamed on our, our cultures. What spaces are there in customary law uh, to deal with gender-based violence and, and the advancement of women? One of the things that was advocated during the dialogue when it comes to gender-based violence was that customary law proper does not condone gender-based violence. There is no space for it. Even that allowance to say you could beat your wife, it came with common law. But there's a big part here. Understanding that customary law is dynamic. It has been influenced by migrant labor and all of the other influences. And, and there is definitely the issue of gender-based violence. But given the fact that traditional authorities are saying it's not customary to beat up anybody. It's to rape. It's not customary. It's not part of anybody's culture. That is space, as, 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 as you correctly pointed out, that can be used to reach out to, to everyone. But people also spoke about the importance of just educating people about embracing human rights because there's a backlash against women. You saw now with the um, uh, 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 killing, and uh, the killing of uh, Dekran. A lot of this killing is a backlash against women. Who do you think you are? Because people think that we have a right to have authority over you. How do you dare say you have authority? And you get that from the Constitution. And first, even in the workshop, there, were other, there was at least one professor who said the Constitution is anti-customary law, and I disagreed with him. But, you know, I did it politely because I'm the convener. <laughs> <laughs> but professor, those are things you write that we need to discuss these things. Yeah. <laughs> we can't blame but, everything on colonialism. <laughs> no, and, and thank you. That those are interesting um, uh, points uh, around j women uh, asserting their, their rights, even within traditional frameworks. I have to politely ask, uh, because we've got you, for a general comment, please, on the Zondo Commission. That's, that's basically wrapping up. But you are still mentioned often. You, you seem to be so embroiled in even the, the rhetoric around this. The former president still scathing about the fact that you didn't allow him uh, his powers, he says, uh, to appoint the judge. Uh, there were some issues around who appointed Brian Malefe, and you responded on social media. But may I just ask for a general comment on, on where whether you believe justice has been served, will be served, um, and, and maybe the rhetoric that, that still continues about your choices way back when. Well, thank you for, for that privilege. Just firstly, uh, the commission has concluded I haven't been called and I can't invite myself. And I can understand why I wasn't called because um, the public protector, the commission does not have the power to review a decision of the public protector, so maybe they had to deal with those difficulties. But about a president who wasn't given an opportunity to appoint a, a judge, with due respect to former President Zuma, that's not true. He was given an opportunity to appoint the judge. He was not given an opportunity to select a judge. Just right now, we got a list, I think it was yesterday, of... Um, shortlisted judges 
for various courts. In some courts, the number of people shortlisted is exactly the same as the number of vacancies. And obviously, the person who is going to be submitted as a selected or as a, a recommended person will only be one. Can we now then lie and say the president, President Cyril Ramaphosa, will be denied the opportunity to appoint the judge just because he did not select the judge? That's just totally disingenuous. But secondly, and, and more seriously, if President Zuma knew that he had a relationship that he thought amounted to a conflict of interest at the time he appointed Deputy Chief Justice Sondo, he had a duty constitutionally and morally to disclose that there and then. To come back now and invent this is really not very helpful. And it's really sad because he did appoint this commission of inquiry, of course, at the direction of the public protector. And he does live in this country and his children and children's children will live in this country. The chaos he's creating is not going to do any of us any good. All right, thank you for that response and, and talking about this conference as well. Uh, so many issues around customary law for another time. Uh, that was uh, Tuli Madansela, Law Faculty Trust Chair in Social Justice at the University of Stellenbosch.